I was right outside this door um, <laughs> planting shrubs and what I didn't realize was when I looked up and heard this roar up above in the sky, there was a huge jet that I could see in the distance, but it, it felt like it was flying way too low. And of course, I had no idea of knowing that there was either even a terror attack on the United States. And so I came in the house, turned on the television, and I believe it was Matt Lauer on the Today Show saying that uh, one plane had flown into one of the towers and then another had flown in. And I was like, oh my goodness. And he was saying, there's a bright sunny day here in New York. This may not be an accident. We're working on our sources to find out what's yeah. going on. And that's when I immediately called the assistant news director and said, what is going on? Should we be coming in right now? And so, um, yeah, that was the first I had, I knew something was wrong. Yeah, it was a beautiful, bright Tuesday morning. I was in the apartment that I had in downtown uh, Cleveland the day before I had been doing reserve work at the Pentagon in oh. Washington, flew up in the afternoon uh, back to Cleveland and did the, the news on Monday night and got up Tuesday and was working on something and I had, I had the Today Show on in the background and yes, there was this uh, report of something hit the World Trade Tower and it was considered to be an accident. I said, oh, that's weird. And uh, there was something more going on. I got a call from the secretary in the news department, Marlene, and Marlene, <laughs> Marlene said, Tim, do you have your TV on? Do you see what's going on? And I looked back at the TV and they ran a replay because I'd missed it, the replay of the second uh, mm. plane hitting the tower. At that moment, something just clicked inside. We were on the air seven hours straight, yeah. I believe, and it was such, um, for me, it was almost like an out-of-body experience because I had to be so focused and I realized once we got to the station, we were under attack and Tim and I were readying to get on the set. And so we had so much information coming in from um, our producers, the uh, news director, I mm -hmm. mean, everybody. And, and the one thing that was different about this breaking news was usually in a newsroom when there's breaking news, you hear people yelling, the producer is saying, I've got a call from a senator or the mayor's on the line or, and reporters are running around. People were doing those kind of actions but it, they were quiet they were and, and, intense. and they were running out, yeah. uh, giving yes, Tim and I handwritten notes of right. information that they had gotten. And, and we thanked them for those that were legible because some <laughs> were not so much, but that we were literally what we call in television, flying by the seat of our pants because we didn't have uh, enough information and we were relying on NBC. And we were relying on NBC. We were relying on uh, reporters and producers in the newsroom calling people locally yeah. because what th this this was going on on two levels you had this massive story unfolding nationally which had us riveted and unnerved but in real time we also had the local implications it was clear that something had happened over cleveland in mm -hmm. our airspace it turns out ramona had actually seen the aircraft no way to know at the time that's what no, it was no way at hopkins they shut hopkins down there was a report that we had in the newsroom of a plane on the ground at Hopkins that had been surrounded because they felt there was a terrorist threat on the plane. That turned out not to be the case. One of the great challenges for us is we're getting these handwritten notes passed back and forth and we're trying to stay on top of what's going on, is trying to sort through for the viewer what we knew and what we just heard. What's real and what may not be real. So we yeah. would say that before. Now we have a report and we try and say from where, from NBC, mm -hmm. from the wire service, from so-and-so. We have a report, we haven't been able to confirm it, that such and thus, and there was a lot of bad information. Oh, there was a lot of bad information. There were people yeah. calling and emailing yeah. saying, um, we heard that fighter jets are going to start shooting yeah. down planes. I've got someone yeah. on a plane in Arizona. So are they really gonna yeah. shoot down the yeah. plane? And it was, you had to take all that information in and like you said, make sure it's factual because we don't do you know hearsay and I remember it being so 
tough to hold it together and try not to get too emotional with the information we were getting. And I think I grew up on the air that day. I mean, I had been in television for a while, but 9-11 made me realize if, and I still get emotional talking about it, but I had to hold in everything I felt. I was fearful, I was angry, I kept mouthing to Tim because our mics were hot and I, we couldn't talk to one another because right. we didn't want viewers to hear what we were saying. And I kept mouthing to him, they attacked us, they attacked us. Because I was, I was literally in shock the whole time and trying to hold back the tears. And I think at one point when I, I knew I was about to go was, when the, uh, the assistant news director said in our ear, people are starting to jump from the towers. And when I heard that, that vision came, yeah. and I had, to, I had to say, Ramona, because I talked to myself a lot up there, do not think about it, do not think about it. And when you see those images coming in from the NBC feed of people running for their lives and the fires and the smoke and the soot, and you just, it was almost too much to bear. And the helicopter shots, because there were helicopters circling the towers before they came down, the helicopter shots of the people reaching out from the windows, trying to, uh, yes, the emotions were incredible. I had many years of military training, and when something happens that is as overwhelming as 9-11, a real-time, real-world situation, a switch gets thrown. Mm -hmm. And you become, you, you should and do become very calm and very intense. And you become absolutely focused on what you're telling people. Well, I realized, um, and because we were getting so much information coming in and people were wanting to know what should we do, where should we go, should we drive somewhere, um, are they going to attack Cleveland? And I think those questions made me realize you have to remain calm. Yes. You have to right. just be clear and concise and factual because if viewers see you lose it, yeah. then they're definitely going to lose it. And so that's the one thing I tried to do on air was to reassure people that we are working diligently as hard as we can to get factual information. You know, stay tuned to your television because this is the place you want to be. And we'll update you as soon as we get more information. And I think overall, Tim and I just tried to calm the fears of viewers while we're delivering them the information as best we could. And calm the fears of each other. Yeah. And we did that. We'd, we'd been sitting next to each other for years doing this several times a day. We knew that this was different. And yes, we had to get it right. Uh, this was serious. It stayed serious for a long time. Yeah. And it changes. Did it change you? It definitely changed me. I, I just remember during the t um, month or two months after 9-11, there was this unity in the United States. Everybody rallied around one another, the camaraderie yeah. between, it didn't matter if you were black, white, you know, a person of color, it didn't matter. Everybody had one common goal and that we were going to unite because um, we needed to, and not just for New York and for the people in Shanksville and DC, mm -hmm. the country as a whole. And so when I look at our country today, how divisive it is, that's the one thing I miss. I miss that camaraderie and everybody listening to one another and not you know, yelling. And, and so I, I wish we could kind of get back to that time. So it, it changed me in a way that um, I just don't take any day for granted. Every day matters to me and I try to make the most of it. And another thing was telling the people I love 
I love them and I care about them. I mean, Tim has been gone for a while, but Tim and I keep in touch. Oh, well, and, yes, we do. you know, I'll yeah. see something pop in my email and he'll say, How are you, Gloriosis? <laughs> he calls yeah. me Gloriosis. I, do. I don't know where that <laughs> came from, but, um, you know, we, we check on each other. And, and I think I'm that way with all of my friends because I realize we're not promised tomorrow. And I know that's a cliche, but it's real. I'd like to make one point uh, in addition to the very important point that Ramona just made about 9-11 uh, did bring people together. We had suffered something collectively and together that brought out this human sense of community. Yeah. But there were fools even then who did, who did ridiculous things. Yeah. Two or three days after 9-11, I got a call. I was in the station. I got a call that said, there are three guys with headdresses out in the lobby and they're, oh. they're Arabs and the, the I terrorists, remember, you yeah, this? I remember that. And I, I went out to speak to them. And when I met them, they were three young men wearing headgear, turban sorts of things. They were not Arabs from the Cleveland area, they were Sikhs and people were attacking their families and their businesses, not understanding who the Sikhs were. And they said, can you help us? Can anybody help us? And we did a story yeah. about that that night. And the Arab community in Cleveland is, is massively supportive of American ideals. They're inclusive, they're embracing. Uh, uh, I, I, I visited the mosques. I know that, that you, you have mm -hmm. many friends in the Arab community. They bore a burden from the people who decided that they would act on their fears rather than their heart. And there are those people in Cleveland. We have them today. They're all over the country. But we must stand up for one another and for what's right. We must not let bad circumstances bring out the worst in us. It has to bring out the best or we won't survive. But what we must remember is that this nation is filled with people who, when challenged, rise to the challenge. We must always bring out the best in ourselves and not play to the worst. The divisiveness that, that Ramona talked about that we all see and deplore was in crystal clear focus that day. People who truly hated us and wanted to do us damage did. That won't stand. And you know you can't, when you're covering news like that, and we had never obviously covered a story like that, yeah. but you can't do it alone. Tim and I were the face of the station at the time, yeah. but we literally had yeah. everybody in the everybody building. Everybody was from, mobilized. I think Betsy and Jimmy were bringing us water because yep. I hadn't had breakfast and we had been on the air so long, and Cold we pizza. had people in the sales department making calls, family members. Everybody collectively yeah. came together to cover that story. And that is what helped us. It's be, absolutely true. Yeah, become yeah. successful in, in delivering that information uh, to viewers. M Mickey Burns, uh, who's now the general manager of the station, but she was head of promotion then. Mickey was in running uh, <laughs> notes back and forth. Uh, the, the, everybody was engaged. Everybody was involved. We took what we were doing very, very seriously. And I hope our viewers did as well. And I think remember they how quiet even people who came in to give us information uh, that we had to disseminate to our viewers. Everybody was so quiet. Yeah, Usually quiet. when they hand you, they'll yeah. say, now this is from da 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 da. And, but they were just like very quiet. They were, well, we knew people were dying. And I think they were in shock too. They, we they, knew <laughs> people were dying. Uh, the, the pictures from New York left no doubt that thousands of people we didn't know how many, but thousands of people were going to perish in this. And what that meant to Cleveland at that time was one of our most fundamental visceral responsibilities and trying to communicate what we heard from the police, from Mayor White's office, from the fire department. Remember the fire chief mm -hmm. was, was good. Um, coordinate the local information and somehow make it run in parallel to what we we're watching nationally, what we're experiencing nationally, was one of our great challenges. 
And then, I'm sorry, uh, then trying to decide what stories, I think Tim touched on this, what stories you're going to present yeah. to the viewer and what story you know is going to terrify them. And I remember watching that NBC feed and sometimes, um, I, I think there was a delay, but sometimes uh, real time, we just had to decipher, you know, and, and say what we were seeing live. And I remember getting reports that um, so many people were running for their lives down the stairwell in the Twin Towers. And we got a report that, you know, of heroics, like four men grabbed this man's wheelchair because he was blocking the stairwell and they carried him down like 16 flight of steps. And then we'd hear other stories of some people trampling other people to get out. And so you have to decipher, you know, which right. do you want to relay those stories to the public because some of them were just unbelievably terrifying. Well, and there was the Washington component of it as well. I'd flown up from Washington. My daughter was in Washington. Uh, I, I had a life in Washington. The Pentagon had been hit. There were reports that there was another plane on the way in and the rumor was it was headed to either the White House or the Capitol building. That was Flight 93, yeah. the one that you saw. And I had no overhead. idea. And yesterday, I stopped in the countryside of Pennsylvania at the Flight 93 Memorial, and I had not done that before. And I would recommend to anyone that they do so. It is somber, serious, appropriate, reflective, and the passengers on that plane would not be defeated. They took it over from the terrorists. They all perished. They all perished. But that plane didn't hit the Capitol, didn't hit the White House, didn't make it to Washington. And I've often thought about Flight 93 because yeah. it came over Cleveland. You know, what if it had not made it to Shanksville and actually It'd come, down, come here. down here? And it could how, how different sure. our lives would have been. One of the things that strikes me is that when a great national disaster like 9-11 strikes this country, it is the good people of cities like Cleveland who rise up to meet it. Always. Always. And uh, that's to be remembered. The elites on either coast can hem and haw and write editorials and pontificate, but the responsibility for dealing with the great issues of our time falls squarely on the shoulders of the people of Ohio and of Cleveland, and they always rise to meet it. And I've always said, you know, in times of catastrophic events, you know, that's Northeast Ohio, because they always rise to the occasion and just literally come together to help, no matter what you need. And that day, I remember, or maybe it was our coverage, you know, the, the days and weeks to follow, I just remember um, parents who had daughters and son who live and work in mm -hmm. New York, and they were so concerned about everything from, you know, they got out of the tower or, you know, their apartment nearby is, is damaged. And there was so much worry about everything and people just, you know, emailing you, what should we do about this and when? And it was, we worked, it felt like we worked on 9-11 for years. For, for, it, felt, <laughs> it, it felt like years. It, um, I don't remember going home. I'm sure we all went home at some point. Oh. But the, the, the time, the, the week, two weeks, three weeks after 9-11 were a blur because we were still processing what had gone on and each day people would turn on we didn't have the internet wasn't a big deal then yeah uh the cable news channels were you know we didn't have not google. a big deal we didn't have google uh we were in the position of being the first word that many people here heard about what was going on we took it seriously and we'd take it seriously today i remember quite vividly uh when i came home um after the uh, terror attack and I sat on those stairs behind me and literally I let out a wail of a, of a, I don't think I've ever screamed like that before. And I just put my face in my hands and I just screamed and I just cried. 
and I was praying and praying, you know, praying for myself, my, my family, my, my city, the, the country. I just held all of that inside because I couldn't cry on the air. I didn't want to cry on the air. I wanted to remain strong and it just all, the floodgates opened. It just all came out. And um, I had to release that because I had held it in literally all day. And I just, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And I knew the next day I had to get up bright and early and, and be strong again. I always love to laugh. That's one of the things, I mean, <laughs> our business is very serious and I take it very seriously, but I love to come to work and enjoy my colleagues and laugh. And I don't think I had enjoyed a good laugh for maybe three months. And um, Jim Donovan, who would always crack me up, there was something he was reporting on set and I just, laughed and laughed and tried to curb my laughter. And I realized Ramona is back. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to laugh again. So I, I'm sure it was Jimmy who triggered my laughter. Tim would get so upset when Jimmy and I were over there. <laughs> Stop, will you? <laughs> but I, I think that probably did it for me. Tim, how about you? I think that I felt life was returning to normal the following 4th of July when the parades with kids on bikes with bunting and flags were all over America. Certainly here, I remember the one Chagrin Falls, Chardon had a big one. Um, I think Westlake had a, a great parade. And people would turn out for them in far larger numbers than they had maybe 10 years earlier. So I think probably by the next 4th of July, I felt America was going to get through all this.